at supernova we are building ai tutors uh, today for spoken english and uh, you know the ultra long term is since 1980s we have known the potential that is not being unlocked because of every child not having a uh, tutor right a personal tutor this is what is called as bloom's two sigma problem where there was an experiment uh, as to what happens if you can provide every child with a tutor and we know a lot of potential is getting wasted because we are not able to do that so fundamentally today gen ai can take us to a future where every person has a personal ai tutor teaching them various things right so that's the ultra long term bet in the short term we are starting with spoken english for kids in india the problem is very straightforward and clear right there are 275 million kids out of this almost uh, you know 220 230 million do not have access to a good quality english learning environment a lot of times not even a good quality english teacher um, and uh, there is just no way to solve this problem in the short term except for with ai uh, you know and english is something that's very important despite that we just don't have enough teachers so we are going to solve that with ai that's the starting point and uh, i've told you already about the ultra long term so that's the kind of bit got it. so a uh, couple of questions on that uh, one is uh, that are you also seeing that kind of improvement that that people saw in that study bloom study uh, wherein a tutor is able to kind of create that kind of a difference in the learning outcomes of a student uh, and i'm asking this question because somewhere while you are a tutor you are offering a tutor but it is an ai tutor who is not sitting next to you and a lot of things change because of that i'm not reading the if i'm the tutor i'm not reading the body language of the child i don't know how i can motivate that, that child and uh, the physical dynamics are not playing out essentially so are are you able to kind of create the same kind of impact uh, as as a as a physical one on one tutor see um there are two parts to it but fundamentally i'm saying for our users right now we are much better than what they had right that's the number one thing we are able to make a difference to their life and deliver value right that we are very very sure about uh, i'll break that into two parts number one we are not dealing with a case here where the child had access to some quality tutor you know not even one is to one even one is to 30 we are not dealing with that kind of a situation we're dealing with kids who did not have any sort of access right so we're talking about near zero access to a good quality learning environment or near zero um, you know uh, chances to speak and practice in your daily day to day life that's what we are dealing with right so because it's next to nothing uh, we are able to quickly bring a huge delta of value add to that user that's number one right so but having said that we are also seeing that our bar is high our bar is not that anyways this child is doesn't have a tutor so anything you do is better than nothing that's not our bar our bar is what you said exactly can we reproduce the magic of someone sitting next to you a very compassionate very intelligent teacher who understands how to motivate students teach them etc can you reproduce that with an ai if you are able to do that you know figure out the product pedagogy technicalities etc and pull it together to give that kind of a service that's when it's magic and uh, what we are seeing is that yes uh, it is definitely possible and we are able to do that uh, with a significant number of our kids uh, we are very able to drive those kind of learning outcomes Uh, yeah that's the, let me stop over there you can push me yeah. and how do you measure those outcomes uh, is it that uh, uh, yeah how how do you see that it's it's not like you are not having the scores or their report cards and all which anyway you know kind of i don't know how, how well they have uh, how much that work uh, because it creates a different kind of a dynamic that you start you know going after scores and grades and somewhere learning gets compromised so how do you i think the question is one is how are you ensuring how are, how are you measuring that there is improvement and second is how are you ensuring that this measurement is not coming in the way of learning because sometimes the metric becomes a goal and then you start gaming it no you're right so i think uh, first of all measure and we are very objective about this there are some things that you can see qualitatively as a teacher right we are teachers as well right so when we prototype these learning experience the first uh, we actually see a few hundred users go through it live in front of our eyes and then we'll try to teach the same concept why you know watch this video talk to this person figure it out and then give an assessment and the same thing we will try to do it again with a learning experience that we prototype then we'll see is there a market difference in how they are picking things up right and that gives us a, and then we also ask them for things like did you have fun uh, you know do you see perceived learning etc right and then we actually benchmark these things so when we see each of our learning experience create a significant delta compared to someone sitting and doing the same thing in a traditional way when we see that happening we know that learning experience works right that is a very how do we prototype things how are we sure kind of a thing but end goal what we measure is 
there are okay let me take a step back so that is number one right number two is we do measure very objective things and you are right picking that metric is very very important so we call it rubrics that's what it is called when you're designing a pedagogy etc uh, so you have to figure out what to measure that's very very important let me give you a couple of things that are very first principled and if you measure them you can be sure that some improvement is happening right number one would be words per minute this is an objective metric there's no way to game this metric correct you speak at length i know what your words per minute for speech is you read at length i know what your words per minute for reading is now over the course of uh, you know working through this product one thing that we have figured out and it's kind of obvious in retrospect is words per minute is a superb indicator of how fluent you are you will see that a child who's struggling would have something like 20 to 30 words per minute but you or me who's comfortable with english uh, you know we would have something like 100 120 words per minute when we speak right if not more so that metric there's no way to force it there's no way to game it and every time you speak into that i'm able to measure this right mm -hmm. so there are some metrics like this that we figured out it's a good indicator and it's hard to game it took some time to freeze on those but now that we've frozen on those it's very clear to us it's a report card for us we know did this child improve or not and look at that objective metric it's telling right so that's how we're doing this okay. just trying to understand see when you see i believe in ai tutor more even not just ai tutor the whole idea of ai mentor it could be uh for all you know it could be your uh, astrologer it could be even your doctor the first opinion who recommends which doctor right. you go to so there, there are various ways in which you know the whole for uh, sure uh, ai can be kind of leveraged uh, yeah and you had the choices and let's say you wanted to kind of focus on education uh, yeah raises two questions why english and why kids these are the design choices you have made so was there some rational thought process uh, behind this See, why English is, uh, okay, so when we came into EdTech, this is 2020, 2021, right? Uh, peak off by Jews, you know, it felt like the whole market told us do not come to EdTech, right? Two reasons, and both were right uh, at that point of time, right? And the people were right to advise us that way. One is, why just too big? What are you going to do here any which ways? There's not much to do here. Uh, that's that's the number one thing. Number two is, even if, uh, uh, you know, if you were to say something like, you know, the pro the problem is really not solved, etc. Right. That was the case, actually. While Baijus was big, if you looked at where the products working for kids, it was a very doubtful thing. Right. We were very clear that, no, it can be significantly better. That's what we felt. Right. People told us, even if you build a much better product and even if you solve a problem that's worth it for your users, your CAC to LTV will never work out. This is the problem for every single edtech today. So, you know, it's just not making sense. And we were also making this choice of going after middle India. So long story short, before we came, the playbook was, especially if you don't look at test prep and rest of K-12, the playbook is go sell to the top 10%, sell something worth of $500 or $1,000. That was the playbook and everybody was going after that, right? We said no. India does not need $500 products. The mainstream India needs something like $50, $100. That's what's affordable for them. So let's do that. But the problem everybody saw was, hey, you are going to an industry where CAC is in the range of $400, $500 and you want to sell this $50 thing. That's crazy is what people told us. So that's the context. Let me first hold over here. Do you understand how we are coming here? When we are yeah. coming, what's the big picture that we're looking at? Yeah. Right. So we were very clear. Hey, while, while there are first principle reasons to believe that there is probably value to be created here, what these guys are pointing out to are very real risks in the business. Will CAC to LTV work out? Will this segment even pay? Can you really create something meaningful to them, etc. Right. So we were very cautious. And I think that's a good thing. Um, in retrospect, we decided if CAC to LTV has to work out, what we pick first has to be an absolute headache. It has to be top of mind. It has to, you should not be convincing the customer that it's a need. They should just know that they should feel the pain already that when you give them that headache tablet, they will take it. Let's figure out what that problem is. We did a lot of, you know, uh, launching a bunch of things, talking to customers. Eventually, it is very clear that English, everybody in India, especially middle class India, knows English is important for a better career, better life, etc. You don't have to tell them that. And they didn't have access. And it seemed like a very huge problem, right? So it fit right into that. Let it be a headache. And cherry on top, LLMs were perfect for solving their English problem because it's a large language model. So if there's one thing it's going to be good at, it's going to be language first, right? So because of those, we said that makes first principle sense. Let's try. If that doesn't work, maybe all of these guys are right. We'll have to pivot and do something. But if it starts working, maybe we know something about this that others are not looking at. That's how we came. Got it. Uh, yeah. But you know, kind of, uh, still you made some other choices, like you focused on kids and not on adults. Uh, now, why I'm asking this question is because uh, 
somewhere in the whole thing, and, and you know, kind of pardon me if I'm wrong, but to me, uh, EdTech has failed India at some level. They failed the investors, they yeah. failed the users. Uh, and probably it was because, partly, you know, what you're saying, but if you kind of go a little, you know, a little deeper, what was happening was they were selling these, you know, large ticket items through this offline sales, yeah. which was a multi-year, you know, kind of package. Yeah. Probably they knew upfront that they will be very poor repeats. If they sell a monthly subscription, people are not going sure. to kind of come back and buy it again. So sure. to, they were actually pushing the moment of truth by kind of right. being aggressive on the sales side and selling a multi-year kind of a package. Sure. And because you're you're kind of you're trying to kind of push that moment of truth, uh, your CAC was going up, and uh, for a while it looked great, but uh, eventually it it came out. You know, the next year it became harder and harder to sell to the next set of people. Around. So the sure. question here is uh, why was it why why the, the real question is that repeats were fundamentally poor, uh, and we have seen this outside India also. Course completion rates are poor. They've tried to do course code based courses. Even among adults, uh, they have not worked really. What have, what they're selling them as that this is a community that you are getting along with it, and maybe that will help you kind of get through the course. But it is, you know, see, education is a bit like like, like how Baiju and you know these folks, uh, those guys, almost like gyms. You know that people don't have the motivation to kind of uh, you know go with it. So let me sell a yeah. month plan. So it was that mindset which which came along. So it was not really ed tech; it was largely ed sales, and that's what these companies were all about. <laughs> but yeah, at the very, I agree with you spot on. But at the very fundamental level, if you have to think about it, the core cool problem is that there is no motivation in the individual, in the user, to go to the gym, to, to practice maths, to learn. Uh, we all want to kind of be fit, but the journey is painful and we don't want to take that pain. Yeah. And that stays true for irrespective of whether you are doing it at a smaller ticket or at a bigger ticket, the motivation is still the problem. Uh, and that's the problem to be addressed. Sure. So, are you kind of uh, how how are you dealing with that? I see the. I mean, what you're describing makes a lot of sense. What exactly is the question here? So the question is uh, the kids. You know, okay. Let, let me uh, rephrase it. The question is that adults may still have some motivation to learn, hmm. but the kids are like they they they're very you know in a very different phase of their lives. It's they will not have motivation. So product where the outcomes are dependent upon motivation will not work, will, will, will be harder to kind of generate repeats. And that's a moment of truth for a product. So if the repeats are not happening and they're not happening because of motivation, it becomes a hard problem to solve. So why kids, why not sure. adults, we still have some motivation. Kids are even harder in that sense. Okay, so hmm, let me break that down. So the question really is, you're solving the gym problem. You know, that's what made, uh, you know, the previous ones that came before us go in a certain direction, why will you be different? So I see, you know, two, three questions here. So let me break this down. So number one is high ticket LTV, high ticket size or low ticket size, the motivation problem remains the same, 100%. I agree with you. But the market expands drastically. So, you know, it's not just that the products didn't work, so the cap shot up. It's also that the product didn't make sense for this market. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're trying to sell a 30,000 rupee spoken English course. This is what it is. You can go check, you know, all of these guys trying to sell spoken English courses. It is this. Now think about how absurd that proposition is. If you can spend 30,000 on a supplementary offering, you probably already are going to a school where the spoken English is not your problem, right? So that particular offering, those who need it, can't afford it. Those who, um, you know, can afford it, do mm -hmm. not need it. That's how it is, right? So that is also a huge factor in your CAC shooting up. You can't make some random product that's not and price point that's not suited for a TG that's large enough and expect that to hold. So I think uh, there has to be a lot of weightage given to that particular choice itself. It's not suitable for India and that's shooting up your CAC. And that is a huge part of your CAC shooting up. I would even say 70 to 80 percent of your CAC shooting up is probably related to this. Now, the real problem uh, that you encounter because of this gym issue, which is basically everybody wants to go heaven, but nobody wants to die. There's a quote like this, right? That's true for gyms and everything. And you're spot on when you point out that that's a problem with this category, right? So uh, that starts affecting you in renewals, not really in your first CAC if you're solving a real problem. That's a nuance uh, that needs to be taken, considered, right? Now coming to renewals. See, we are very first principle. See, we are here for 
high risk high reward all of us here right like that's what a vc funded startup is so no no way we are claiming that it's an easy goal right but where where a lot of people see problem we see opportunity um i'll tell you why we see opportunity it's one of the hardest things to do but if somebody can make it happen for you then you're willing to pay right it's extremely pay worthy people consider it so it's a gold mine that is hidden uh, you know beneath layers and layers of uh, you know some issues that you'll have to cause barriers but if you cross them then we see a huge reward right so high risk high reward now why do we think it's possible right two one first principle why is it how can we say that it's impossible yes it's hard but maybe you can create the right system to do it and there are precedents so if you take the duolingo for example do you know that more millions of people on an app that's not a class there's no teacher coming and forcing you there's nothing of that sort do you know duolingo has millions of users who have a streak a continuous streak of more than one year do you know that no i didn't know that more than one year yeah think about how crazy that is right so you can do that it fundamentally takes a different dna it fundamentally takes you reinventing everything and not listening to all of this noise and just focus on the customer but you can do that there's this other company called kumon now that's a 70 year old company 60 70 years old if you look at kumon they do 400 million in revenue and uh, you know obviously there are pros and cons to all sorts of pedagogies but they get the job done they are able to get your kids to do worksheets on a very regular basis and uh, you know take kids you know the biggest selling point if you walk into a kumon center is they will tell you give me your child 6 months one year if they are in grade 2 they will start doing grade 4 math and you will see that they will start showing you sheets etc it's undeniable and people rave about it so you know for the right kind of system if you reinvent it and make it easy for the user maybe we can jump into that i believe it is possible to create a system which makes it easy for people to overcome their own um internal issues which is i want this goal but i just don't have the discipline to go after this goal but i really really want it and i hate that i can't uh, achieve this goal there your product needs to help you figure out how to help the user with that particular thing issue that they're dealing with and that's a goal mine that's how we are looking so but uh, you know kind of uh, you talked about come on come on is and yeah. you talked about solving for motivation the way come on is solving for motivation is not through a tutor in fact what they have is a supervisor who is not even teaching them it's their co- curriculum which is designed in a manner that it is very incremental and kids you know get comfortable with one level and then they move to the le- 1.1 level or whatever it is uh their motivation is coming because there are other kids sitting there is physicality of the space there is a supervisor you cannot you don't you're forced there is a forcing function of time space uh where you are just there and you you kid doesn't have choice you cannot just you know go out you know and do something so they just kind of made to do that so the way they, they're actually i don't know i could be wrong uh but they're solved for motivation by creating that forcing function and you don't have that forcing function so and that's why so, i go okay. to the question that why yeah. kids and i don't know when you when you're talking about more than a year streak of more than a year on dueling work was it kids was was it adults or what was the no, issue no it was adults okay so let's split this out right i would like to answer the question of why kids uh, later let's first just tackle this first principle issue yeah. of hey all of us have these things we want to be fit we want to learn and all of us to be mm-hmm. honest suck at it right like because that's why mooks have completion rates of 5% as humans we are flawed there we are not able to you know forgo short term gratification to go after a long term goal that's a flaw mm-hmm. with humans right now so the real fundamental question that you are asking and that applies to a lot of places is are humans going to be able to create systems that help them beat this fundamental flaw and achieve goals right are we able going to be able to create that yes or no is the first first principle question that we are answering correct yeah. and there i i give you a question that come on in its own way and, and you know uh, dueling on max in its own way they have kind of proven that this is possible and you are saying yes. we we are also kind of gunning for that you are if it is first principle if it's possible the moment it's not impossible anymore then as an entrepreneur i start chasing it because there's a gold mine on the other end right so okay. if it is possible there are 250 million kids here you solve it you can create massive good and you can make a lot of money in the process why not right so we are not shy of challenges so the moment you decide i mean if you're saying first principle it's not possible then we'll take a step back but if we start seeing possibility of you can make it happen we won't right so, so that's how we are going yes yeah. yeah. uh, so, so there we are we are aligned the question is yeah. for kids it has been solved in a physical environment with a forcing function for what you're saying has been solved uh, for adults in a with gamification and streaks and you know maybe leaderboards and all that what you're saying is without forcing function kids can you know kind of be you know kind of uh, you can can drive outcomes there yeah how are you going yeah. about it when is you know the two questions here then yeah now let me come to the second question right. of kids versus adults who yeah. has bigger motivation correct yeah. and why did you make that choice see 
I wouldn't say this particular thing. I considered it very deeply when I made that choice. Uh, it was more like there are enough kids here. Let's try to solve that problem and see what, where that takes us. That's how we got in. Not with super uh, great clarity that kids will have more motivation, less motivation. We didn't know, right? Uh, and in fact, when we came in, the thought process is don't sell to kids, sell to adults. Not because of the motivation issue, more because of this factor that buyer and user are the same. <laughs> when it comes to adults so you know from a distribution standpoint you do have a strategic advantage it's a different uh, ball game right uh, yeah. that was the reason that concerned us at that point of time maybe i'll answer that later but i'll tell you what i'm seeing now now we actually started selling to adults which you probably saw we started recently experimenting and the mind blowing fact is kids are four or five times more consistent than the adults the average kid the retentions are way better so you know at least and we've been doing this for a while right so what we see is kids are super excited by small things like animation gamification leaderboard if that can make a certain kind of impact on a 25 year old if it can have that kind of an impact i mean kids are even more excited about those small things a character telling them hey wow etc means the world to them so uh, probably because of that or exact first principle reasons i don't know if i've thought about it enough to distill it but i am sure that end of the day the kids are easier to take through this pedagogy and uh, drive learning outcomes and by a mile compared to the adults so you know at least from what i am seeing uh, operating i i see very different reality definitely kids are not less motivated right that is the right. thing that we are seeing yeah. and when you see kids kids itself like you know i have a kid in class 4 and another kid in class 7 so they are very different like it's three years apart the way they think the way they kind of the kind of things they like is like they're very different and i see that journey i don't know you know you're too young you don't have kids so you you may not relate to that but when you're saying kids you're talking about from k1 to k12 or something like that but this is like k1 is 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 no way clear what uh, you know similar like uh, to k12 kid so yeah. within that uh, why you are chosen kids there are like multiple sub segments there so how do you think about that and are you focused on one sub segment over other or there you are seeing better results on one sub segment over other can you talk about that Yeah, see, we are seeing better results in grade one to eight. That's where most of our users are clustered. And in retrospect, you can reason with it very well, right? You can say, you know, nine, ten, eleven, twelve onwards, that board exam starts taking precedence over everything else in that parents' head, yeah. right? They just don't want to do anything yeah. else. Yeah. You know, exercise can wait. Good habits can. Everything can wait except for that examination is how it is, right? So that's probably why. Uh, you know, it's something that we expected, but it's not like we optimized for. Let's not get kids from grade twelve. Naturally, that was the expectation. And when we went in, you can see that in data. It's like a sharp drop you can see that board examination come to every one of your charts right yeah. so that is happening on the other end or i mean on the other end and then on the younger end obviously the kid is too young right you're not really expecting a pre kg kid what can you really do with it right so you uh, we also maybe we'll do something in early childhood later but at the moment our product our offering is not really uh, supposed to resonate with a pre uh, pre kg kid for example or somebody yeah, which age is what you're focusing and within that yeah, yeah, the, behaviors play out the median kid is 3 4 yeah there is a lot of differences what we are seeing is you know uh, the thing that surprised us so these two are very obvious right like you don't expect pre kg kid you don't expect grade 12 kid okay makes sense mm-hmm. the thing that surprised us was why do we thought actually a lot more clustering would be there on the younger side right like we thought the younger 1 to 4 would be 90% that's what i would have expected if you were ask me to guess but what really turned out is 1 to 8 it's a it's you know 5 to 8 also has a substantial so, you know substantial amount of kids trying to do this kids and parents and what we are realizing is uh for different boards and different kinds of people the time in which they become serious about english turns out to be different so for example if you're in a cbsc school icsc school etc then you're probably a lot more worried early on so you'd see that in the early grades over there there's a lot more conversion but with something like state board etc maybe when it, when it comes to 5 6 is when it hits us so with state board we'll see peaks around grade 5 grade 6 maybe even grade 7 at times right so uh, like that depending on the board and a bunch of other factors different people choose to become serious about english at different times and because of that it's not 1 to 4 it's 1 to 8 that's what we see and how is your product so you're seeing the, these kids differently but you're seeing similar engagement and could yeah. be driven by boards and other things but yeah. uh, is the product same for both of both these sub segments uh, or today it is similar and you intend to kind of differentiate it over time what is same see inside the right now we are very much evolved right there are multiple learning tracks that and uh, you it's not one track for everyone right so we have six broad tracks for kids and then within those there are a lot of nuances it's aligned to the common european framework etc right so when you come in first thing that we do is do a level test and then we take into account you know your other factors like okay maybe your level is low but then you're an older child maybe you are a younger child but your level is high so there are some nuances mm-hmm. like that so all of this goes into 
you know determining which track what kind of assignments are uh, going to come to you so the fundamental product capabilities are exactly the same but as a user you would experience the product to be very different like what a, a child in one track would see would be totally different from what a child in another track is seeing being pushed on being challenged on what are they trying to learn etc right so uh, capabilities wise yeah exactly the same product but end user experience wise very different products for each of these personas got it but there are also kind of uh, i understand there is some bit of gamification yeah but uh, kids get distracted all the time uh, yeah you give them a you know new you know lego set and in 3 days they are just done they want something new or then something new so how do you keep up with the kids in this kind of a scenario because whatever you throw at them uh, they are not inherently motivated and they get very easily bored so is it that you have to keep it's almost like a uh you have to come up with a new story and a new new game very frequently to keep them engaged or you have figured out figured out something else see so i can tell you current numbers is m1 is close to uh 90 95 percentage m3 oh. is close to 80 and m6 is close to 55 to 60 somewhere in that range right and so it's the tracks of 6 months so m6 six does months, not right. require pre purchase or right correct m6 does not require repurchase typically right like 80% of the time we are experimenting quite a bit sometimes you sell one week package also but yes typically mm, that is the current numbers and uh, i think uh, there are two things that are so yes i don't believe in making a new game to get you back every time actually the way we think about it is you need a game that kind of scales across in the sense you can't build specialized games every now and then that's not going to work the content velocity won't be good and uh, you can't nail so many games this is too much right mm-hmm. rather you're looking for these game mechanics that go across like for english we figured out a bunch of english games that can be employed uh, in a very uh, broad sense right i don't have to reinvent the wheel i'll rather th- with this game mechanic i can increase the difficulty etc and create progressions for you i can layer with a bunch of things where it starts feeling different for you so that's the thing we're not trying to create new new games to keep them interested we don't believe in that right now right we think that's not a good strategy now so i think uh, what there are two three things that we are observing one streaks points etc really matter so once you are able to have you seen uh, college kids uh, you know go crazy about snap streaks i have no idea what is this snapchat streaks so if you message someone on a snapchat you have a streak with that person okay like with everybody you have streaks you'll be like i have a 300 streak a day streak chatting with this person and you will never break it so if you're able to get the user to attach to something like this if you can get a college kid to attach to some number on an app really who really cares about that snap streak nobody writes but we do get attached to those numbers likes followers at least those man nowadays you can monetarily link it to something the snap streak etc are the best example and duolingo also that's why the streaks Yeah, is, uh, that that's the thing that's driving so you can get these kids attached to a bunch of things like this that helps a lot and it's been done many times right like people have employed these mechanics to to make us do various sort of things we are just employing them for education right But so that what it uh, rishi this is uh, this is more of an optimization it is like uh, but it goes a long way in driving a behavior sorry it goes a long way in building a habit and driving a certain behavior like employing this well goes a long way it makes a huge difference between see for example uh, just by deploying streaks these are experiments in the past i've seen averages shoot up three times monthly averages shoot up three I'm times not question that what i'm saying is this is yeah. not inherently improving the product it is kind of creating something else in my mind that if i don't do it my streak will be lost and i'll, I'll be reset to zero or something like that which is making me kind of do this and it works but fundamentally the product i'm not loving the product more because of it No, no, hold on. So I'm breaking this down for you, right? So right. this is not the only. If this is all it is, you are right. It's a very shallow thing. All I'm trying to say is, see, you want to do this. You didn't earlier have this discipline in your head. Something was making you drop off. Now the streak, maybe the streak. I can't lose this streak. Up. That thought helps it's you be sure every time. Let, yes, let and that's a huge thing, right? Because you are struggling to show up every time. You wanted to, but you didn't have the discipline to do that. Now I'm able to introduce this cost in your head in the form of a streak where you start yes. maybe just optimizing for the streak, but that's fine. because of that you showed up now so i'm able to achieve show up with mechanics like that that is one Indeed. number 2 is the core learning experience itself we make it feel like small puzzles and we make sure it's only 15 20 minutes long we don't bore you with long lessons so we really optimize that experience and polish it so much that when you come experience it you are actually very pleasantly surprised as a child because typically education means your parent is asking you to go to some tuition sir that you don't want to go to show up to school that you don't want to do open a book that you really don't want to sit in and here your parent is handing over the phone which they never do typically and asking you to play a casual game it can't get better than that and they are like 
appreciating you after that 15 minute session that you were like wow i can't believe i can play a game and finally my parent is happy with me playing a game how does this work right so um, that's how that kid will start feeling and third see everybody has an intrinsic motivation everybody wants to learn right so that parent is also like every time this ch- ch- child is doing this both of them are feeling very rewarded and happy about this choice that they've made and th- the parent is also now saying hey, this is good you have to keep this habit and reinforcing for that child because it's something as fundamental as english maybe tomorrow with math etc right that parent is also bringing that um to the child they're reinforcing that behavior quite a bit motivating them encouraging them if them they do it uh, and all of these things add up and because of that you can take the student forward and i think the second part which i mentioned of polishing that experience so much and making it fun taking so much care we are able to show that kid a huge delta between what is it used to experiencing a boring class where nobody really cares about do you enjoy it or not that versus this it's a world of a difference right so we make it closer to a casual game and we don't give a lot of reasons for you to drop off and nail it with streaks etc and the fact that you want to learn your parent wants you to learn also helps so that's how we are looking at it. so it's a bunch of things got so uh, but you know kind of uh, like the example you took uh, like you guys have this 20 questions game right yeah there is novelty initially when the kid gets introduced to it they want to play it every time then they run out of characters they run out of you know all these uh, personalities to guess also it becomes like you know maybe the first few questions become boring and you know the fun starts happening after that or something so what i'm trying to say is that uh, while it's it's great to get you started but it has its own shelf life at some point people will say oh i've done it enough uh i don't know whether it shows up after one month two months after five plays 15 plays but it would show up somewhere right there are very no, few right. which which kind of sustain us even if it is we yes. like, like some board games we'll play and then we'll kind of okay we are done we have played it enough now there is no no not much fun as much it's it's that there is diminishing maybe marginal fun also something like that that plays up yeah so how do you can kind of, bring that back uh, that excitement back okay now we're going to game design it's fine right but that's then we have to start thinking like a game designer and to see to answer that question right you're right not all games are equal right everything has a different shelf life different kind of excitement different you know take off tying and all of that right so um, i don't think that any questions game is a good example of something that has long term sustenance it is actually one of the first few experiences that we prototyped in early stage if you ask me to rate it on you know how much uh, what is the staying power of that particular game i would say it's fairly limited it's something that gets you excited exposes you to you know how good the platform can be but that's about it i wouldn't it's a gimmick in my opinion right but there are these other games which you explore the app if you seen there'll be this jumble kind of games for words uh, there'll be certain formats like that those we see to have long term sustenance and uh, the reason why it happens in my opinion is there are two things that need to happen okay one it has to feel like a puzzle etc but you need to feel challenged adequately inside that construct like for example let's say i give you a, a jumble sentence and ask you to form the right sentence let's say that this is a game that i put you to you will find it super boring because it's very easy for you so you're not being challenged adequately but for a child who's trying to master english they'll feel like a super engaging experience because for them they are like making these sentences in their head trying to make it fit etc now this one has long term sustenance because initially you can only form simpler sentences i can keep increasing the difficulty of the game and as you keep mastering you're also mastering the language which is my end goal so i am moving you towards the goal and every time you're at a particular place i have a more complex kind of a thing to throw into that game where you're again challenged so when you strike those you are able to drive long term retention and it can go on for you know your couple of years is not at all a stretch maybe even 2 3 years that's why you're able to see someone like dolingo pull off that millions of people with one year streak because they make it like that right they write amount of difficulty and some games that don't feel as boring at all right like where if you increase the difficulty it's always engaging so that's i think the key but if i'm not wrong they they have this cheat code also that you can pause the streak because there's some something they give Uh, which allows you to maintain your streak it's not, not too much actually uh, okay. so you know if you really think about it out of the 365 days maybe like 10 days they got something the average okay. person out there that's still not bad right like 55 days of randomly an app somehow making so many adults who are all distracted in their lives doing a bunch of things do some language learning every day is insane right so you wouldn't have imagined it's possible thank god they are there otherwise maybe human civilization will think it's impossible and we'll be limited by that somebody is showing you the way and i think that's just a start and anyways i think we have to solve this problem right uh, as is, we'll have to figure out how to make products do this bridge this gap for us between our motivation and what we really want right so i think it's possible and uh, yeah 
I'm sorry, I think a diagnosis, but, but I think it's possible. Yeah. In the way I think about it, like some as someone said that India has India doesn't have an education system. What we have is an examination system. Like very early in our lives, like what you're talking about, K9 kid, getting into that zone, board exam. Uh, it's not about learning as much. It is about what is my, what are my grades in my board exams, then what competitive exam am I cracking? And a lot of my, you know, like we have the, the, the poor country that we are, the, the securities are not there. So we end up kind of looking at, at our lives from very early on, that one exam to another, and that's our, you know, kind of path to prosperity. So in the process, education gets compromised somewhere. And we optimize for the grades and the and the ranks. But you're kind of uh, you're not talking about examination for sure. You you are not even in some way talking about education. You're talking about learning, which is like even more fundamental. And what I've seen is at least you know uh, kids they don't like to study, but they're curious. They want to learn. Somewhere yeah. in a journey, probably it is driven by that examination focus. Or I don't know, you know, I'm able to, I'm not able to kind of point it. But kids have this inherent need to learn. It's just that yeah, they're moment, curious in general in life. Yeah, they're yeah. curious and they want to learn also. They feel good when they learn something. Yeah. But the way we have packaged it. Yeah. There's a difference between you know learning and studying. They don't want to study. They want to learn. I don't know. Yeah. If this, uh, yeah. Yeah. There is a difference. Yes. See, kids will naturally you bring something. They'll be like, "What is this? I want to open, etc." Now, if you tell this child, don't touch it, sit on the chair, I'm going to tell you what it is and listen to me. You know, it's a boring time to death. So they have a natural curiosity. It's just, I think, uh, I think we've done it the wrong way. Uh, we have to redo it. Having said that, see, one thing that I've realized, sorry, slightly off topic is, sure. I think the education system gets a very bad rap and uh, it's very kind of unfair. I'll tell you why. Because I was also there. That's why I came here. I was like, this whole thing is broken. School sucks. Examination sucks. Everything needs to change. But then now I am starting to realize while it's not good as you keep growing up, it's not good at uh, at something like, let's say, I'm building a uh, uh, startup today. Is this education system good for training me to do something like this? Absolutely not, right? So those are the kind of things that it sucks at. But it's good at taking hundreds of millions of people and making them be thorough with something like ABCD. I can read, I can write, I can do basic math. And when that kind of um, basics go into hundreds of millions of people, it has a huge impact. There's a huge difference between a society where 100 million people can read, right? They can't really do product stuff, problem solving, etc. But they can read, write and do basic math. And yes. compare that to another society where that didn't happen. It's a very different world that you're looking at, right? So I think from that standpoint, the education system for all the assembly line stuff, all the things that we tell, it does do something at scale. And I think that is good about it, right? So, uh, you know, just a slight off topic. So the, we can't completely dismiss it. It's able to do something. That's why I think it stays, yeah. right? Now, having said that, I do think you can package this in a very different way. I think what was not happening is it was not possible to do this kind of packaging and deliver something so nice to everyone earlier. Like when we started, our problem was everybody is illiterate. Let's somehow get a lot of these guys to be literate. And so from there, going to the school system made a lot of sense. Today, I think with technology, this has become possible. So you can now take a step back, repack, package the whole thing such that the kid really loves it. That's a possibility. And if you do it like that, they are not, uh, they are also curious and they will do their things. Just don't bore them to death, right? So uh, that's how it began. Okay. So Rishi, uh, you know, the usual question, you know, we, we investors have, is that why now? That is pretty clearly answered in this case, LLM to yeah. not LLM. Yeah. But LLM to sabka hai na? So it's not just you who are, uh, who have access to these LLMs. <laughs> yeah. And typically what we have seen is uh, when it becomes easier to build, it becomes harder to compete. So right. just that you are there and you, you are a product guy has some experience in a tech and, and, and passion to build in this. There are more Rishis, there are more Aniruts. Yep. And they're also seeing LLMs are now capable. AI mentors are possible. AI tutors are possible. They're seeing what Duolingo Max has done. Uh, they also know what Kumon has done. They also realize English is valuable. So all the pieces that you're talking about, uh, the question is not why now. The question is why you. Uh, because I think the question is also why now that didn't have an answer, but I agree with you because it has an answer. Maybe the question here is why you. Um, uh, see, I will tell you. So I have a slightly different thought process here, right? So are there wide modes that are already very clear, like wide impossible modes, like I have a networking effect that you can't break. 
kind of a moat yet that we figured out not yet right um but there is one one thing that i uh, one first principle i want to go through two minutes of story before i get back to because that's important for this reason right so uh see when people talk about pmf moats defendability easy to reproduce etc they typically talk about it as if it's a binary right like what i mean by that is people ask me do you have pmf right the right question is pmf for what scale is the right question because i have pmf for i have all the answers for 10 20 million dollars of yearly revenue already but do i have it for hundreds of millions of revenue no someone who has it for hundreds of millions of revenue do they have it for billions no right so typically you will just say pmf is there or not no the real question is at what scale there are two answers to this spectrum it's a spectrum is what i'm trying to tell you it's but a lot of times you'll be, see people treat as if it's a binary thing right either you are pmf or no no i have pmf for a somebody who's running a tea shop as a pmf for a 1 lakh rupee business somebody who's running a coffee chain as a pmf for maybe crores of business right so you have pmf for a certain kind of a volume right similarly when you say is this easy to execute or not it's not a binary it's a scale right and uh, you know the other end of the spectrum is you have an obvious white moat that nobody can do you got a patent a technology that nobody else has access to or something like that right yeah, yeah. Or most, most, mostly don't exist you know like let's say you can create that i think it's important to think you have to create it for the long term but well, uh-huh. let me yeah. you know uh, see i'm not saying you know whether they are moats or not uh, i think i i think it, a company early in their journey will not have moats it's it's very rare it's impossible almost uh, the question here is that when the entry barriers are lower more people go after it let me give you an example uh-huh. so like, no no i agree with you i got your question actually on spot on that's what i'm heading to so can i go uh, and sure. if you see that yeah. i'm not getting it you push me back no problem right so i agree with you so so yes great so when you when i can tell you that it's impossible to execute uh, by copying me is when i have a wide moat that's my first point which i don't have at the moment now yeah. having said that is it a easy business really no if you really think about it see i have operated in a lot of lines of business i've been in e-commerce been in you know clear tax kind of saas i've been um, i've been to these bunch of places me and my co-founders together right i can tell you that if you're not looking at this binary and ask what does it really take how many things have to fall in place for this business to work it's a lot okay so it's uh, basically what i mean is i am not selling one llm wrapper app that anybody can do in another two days and that's all the business is all about if that was the case you're right right i'll tell you the number of things that has to fall in place for this right you need to be need to be super good at tech and product so why am i saying i am super good at tech and product see i have data science experience for the last 6 7 years taking technology and then product productizing it in production to make pnl impact and we've created some of the best technologies uh, like for example in my last e-commerce journey we've created delivery assignment algorithms where we had some of the best efficiencies in the market although there were players at 100x scale compared to us we can get better efficiencies on our delivery just because of our algorithms right or if you look at a forecasting algorithm that takes you to inventory days you know forecasting algorithm inventory days and fulfillment those are the two opposing factors so i've had phenomenal uh, fulfillment at something like 10 12 days of inventory in a market where credit days is 20 so i can reverse the cash flow just by doing that right and a lot of people yeah can't do that so the way we understand tech and product we are hardcore tech and product folks that have produced some of the best technology in this country there are not a lot of people that you can pick who can execute like us right so first of all i don't think it's an easy problem you give like 5 10x more money to another team they'll not be able to pull off uh, what we are pulling off this because fundamentally uh, everybody of every one of us understands what we're building we know where to cut how to go we're not taking to ai engineers for figuring out something in a silo right we understand this thing so first of all this tech and product is not easy it's not as hard as building an llm from ground up but it's not an easy problem either just from a tech and product standpoint right now the number two thing is see why are hardware startups hard because there is an initial r and d period before which you cannot market the product correct it tech is something similar you can't just go with two go two classes i figured out let me launch you can't be like that you need a phase of r and d and there's a certain amount of failure risk in that r and d itself before you have something that works right and not you can't guarantee that everybody that set out to do this can do this right it's not a commodity even if you look at my app you don't know all the nuances in it you can't just rip it off like you rip off an uber app or something like that there's so many moving parts to it that it's impossible for you to simply copy me you'll not know what went wrong you may think you understand something you'll reimplement the ui looks of it but you don't know all the nuances that are going in so you won't get the same retention that i do and that's my secret sauce so unless you know every bit of it you can't replicate the same kind of retention and learning outcomes that i do so there's a huge risk of r and d failure and that is just now you have okay i somehow figured out academics somehow the product is working that itself is a thing that many people won't cross on top of it your sales has to fire 
your marketing has to fire your cat to ltv has to work out and and we also have operations in the form of human tenders so you need that mentors you need that operational excellence all of this needs to happen so you would pick a random team give them 2 million the vc is going to be like where is growth coming but this guy needs to do a year or two of work and there is a lot of failure before he gets something that can market like us and god knows whether he'll crack sales marketing etc so my point is it's not as easy it's one of the most difficult businesses out of all the things that i have done e-commerce may it doesn't matter you throw more money at the problem you give 30% discount instead of 20% people buy from you that's all it takes to switch someone it's a commodity that's not the case here and it's there is no guarantee that you can throw money at someone and they'll win but you can do that with e-commerce right so it's a very difficult problem it's not as easy uh, it's in a scale i think it's on the other end it's closer to the wider moat rather than this kind of i throw money at this and i can win this market kind of a uh, commodity market so yeah. so couple of comments here. i think uh, most founders you know and that's how it works like we yeah. we kind of rate ourselves on what we want to do <laughs> what we have sure. in our minds uh, sure. our roadmap vision everything and when we kind of rate our competition we look at their last year's product or last year's <laughs> sure. and maybe yeah. it, it's it's, it's yeah, maybe there's a bias you see yeah i agree with you somebody you have to believe that you're crazy enough yeah. to disrupt that's when you can be an entrepreneur so yeah. i think there could be a bias like that agree yeah. so yeah. but that apart see i understand on the product side and you know kind of bunch of experiences coming together and you know building this product and real passion behind it but when it comes to marketing when it comes to sales you know if your product is better it does not make my product worse uh i have to kind of fight my own battle you have to fight your own battle if you are competing but if i am throwing more money at marketing it actually worsens your mar- marketing your cats go up the the keywords get bid out all those things happen right so what i'm trying to say is one from a founder perspective i t- i take what you say but from an investor perspective there will be someone who will say okay this looks like a nice space there is a, there, there is a company here that i think most people will agree that there is a company to be built here yes and you may have seen those uh, you know kind of hardships and you have figured out few things every journey is different i'm sure someone else will figure out something else in a different way and all so they will also get capitalized so there will be multiple companies which will get capital to go after this problem especially with okay. what uh, you know duolingo has proven and that's how most like and as you're saying it has been proven means that the a good team can go after it right so you want what they have proven a product they're not they don't have any idea about the indian market they are not able to crack it and nobody has a road map Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that part. That's why I'm mean, not even asking you. You know, if Duol- Duolingo has cracked it, why can't yeah. they do Tamil to English and all that? I think those yeah. nuances uh, take much longer. Their focus may not be there. And I've seen enough. You know, kind of unless you really, really go after market, it's very hard. Yeah. Um, but my question is, uh, they they may not they cannot undermine your product. Someone who comp- competes with you, but they can actually adversely impact your marketing by just bidding for keywords and all. And somewhere. uh when when we were talking about byju and you know kind of uh, the first or second wave of it take that we had uh it was offline sales driven big tickets offline sales it's not just saying small tickets that allows you to do performance marketing yeah but it is still the same problem that performance marketing is there's still nothing like i don't know if there's plg there's network effect there's referral those are the things which make it you know kind of easier like like in the case of like we're talking about kids and games you know yeah yeah it's, yeah. it's a beautiful thing like you know Now, kid, one kid will pull in the other, and yep. every time those dynamics will play out, which makes it so much easier for them to scale. Yes, Reliance on performance marketing does not end. Yeah, up. I've not seen many companies kind of. No, I agree with you. They, they use it to get to a critical mass, and then the the story changes. Yes. So, is it fair to say that you have not cracked that piece yet? And maybe you will, maybe you will not. But what is the current situation? Like, if someone comes, a real good team, and throws more capital at it, your cats will go. Okay, buyer. Then you you know you start thinking about okay, my LTV. Shall I increase my LTV? Maybe from six months you are thinking to go to trial packs and you know three months and all that. You start moving in twelve months and then you start you know kind of facing the same problems that why you faced. Maybe in performance marketing and not in optimization. So can you kind of uh, yeah yeah. So I think uh, this competition will will make you do things differently. So how do you address this CAC problem? How do you ensure that the CAC actually goes down as you as you scale? Okay, yeah, sure. So. Okay, there are two, three questions here. Again, let me break that down. Right. So, one thing that I want to highlight is, it's not a hypothetical. It is right now a reality. I don't want to name any names, but there have been very well-funded players who've been here before us. Probably had four, five x of our funding. 
who've been trying to crack the space and it's not like people are not trying to crack it already but i can tell you there are very few people who made our cac to their cac to ltv work come as far as we have and they've been trying for 2 3 years so why am i saying that am i saying that you know i am the best nobody can do this no i'm just trying to point out that many people have tried and the success ratio has been so poor that you have to start assuming that something about this market is hard if you look at that particular data point it's undeniable right and it's not like we are trying english for the first time there have been so many well funded players who tried to crack it nobody has come as far as we have so far so obviously if you just look at that number it is a hard problem somehow we've crossed one great filter that could have been anything there is a filter there that is filtering people and we seem to have crossed at least one of those right a very great filter where you're getting to millions tens of millions of dollars or millions is very clear to us now i think that's fair to say i think we um uh, we've crossed that a lot of teams have not right that is one um number two is see it's not obvious that you have to go after this space that again is a mistake what we are doing is still a very unconventional bet that most people will be scared to take right be people entering the market or for existing ones so it's a no go right what we are doing is craziness these guys are selling 500 dollars their sales team thrive on 200 dollar incentives 100 dollar incentives and if you go tell that sales team and that business team let's start selling stuff at 50 dollars i can only imagine how that no, conversation goes so you know it's a dilemma it's not going to happen it's be like dude you're crazy you'll kill the existing business that's all will be inside those companies for newbies right everybody is going to tell them in india you can't build a big business it's stupid to go after this 50 dollar market so to actually having the conviction to stick to this market and keep going forward it's a risk that you need to somehow internalize and take it and a lot of people are not able to take that risk right they think there is nothing here like i said people won't pay cac won't work out margins yeah, won't work out is that you no, nobody believes in what you believe that's the biggest that is idea. also a factor right that we should consider that means that the probability of somebody taking the shot is significantly lesser that also needs to be considered right? if it's but yeah. obvious everybody is jumping in that's a very different scenario than you look at it you look at my revenue will still say i don't know maybe it'll tap out at 10 million maybe it'll tap out 20 million i don't know if i can take that bet that's how most people are and that's good for us that means that for a while nobody is coming here first of all it's hard and nobody wants to come here great good place to be for us right so that's the second thing um now the third thing is you told me is it fair to say you've not cracked gtm something like that you asked me correct right So the question is I would uh, say no no so I agree with you CAC seems no, to No no I agree with you so I'll tell you what I have answers for and honestly I can with what we have figured out so far 10 20 million dollars of revenue without any new offering nothing else falling in place today the announcements that I want covered if I just execute on that start scaling this we have answers for 10 to 20 million do we know how much of Tamil Nadu right uh, yes that, because see we we are very we going to launch we that is something that i can tell you with a high certainty that whatever we made it work in tamil nadu we'll easily make it work in another 5 to 10 regions if not more so in tamil nadu we are very confident of 2 3 million dollars of year new uh, revenue run rate so it can be uh, 10 20 million dollar kind of business we very sure about now 20 to 100 i think the thing that's going to make a difference between us being a category defining giant and a biggish company maybe t- doing tens of millions of dollars is can you crack organic viral uh referral can you innovate on distribution can you do that or not are you going to be reliant on traditional channels alone is going to make all that difference and that's the risk that you're taking along with so what i'm saying is the downside is i'm confident of building this business to tens of millions hundreds of millions or not rests on can you nail this product can you get referral people raving about the product can you innovate on distribution and such that is phase 2 that's the fundamental but if that is done then you know massive problem distribution is figured out and a kickass product you're going to dominate this category and people are not going to able to come after you so uh, that's the thing that you are looking at and that's what we are focused on so i agree with you i don't have answers for 100 million today but even with what i have today 10 20 million is pretty much will i i think revenues, you can drive that for sure yeah so revenue is one part of it rishi but uh, the cap and you know kind of let's say you no, no, i'm saying in, like when i say 10 20 million i mean with a sustainable cap otherwise you can keep right. like if you raise yeah. enough money you can do 50 million revenue by burning 200 million right that's not right. what i'm talking about i am talking about you can do this very very sustainably cash flow positive profitable kind of 10 to 20 million stability is very very much possible even if you don't uncover even one more amount also so so the question is uh, in today's environment but let's say when, once you hit this success the word goes out more teams get cap you know funded go after similar problems the cap today what whatever it is 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 still on the higher side then it goes even further out of control is is, is what my so let me ask a different question maybe that will uh, lead to the uh, to your answer that uh, in your journey how will you reduce your cap 
in your mind, whatever you have, whatever you're thinking, if let's say the problem statement to you is that I want to reduce my cap, what will you do? Yeah, which How is the problem work? statement generally. That's the most important problem statement. So <laughs> yeah. I resonate with you. See, the number one thing is, I think nail the product. See, first of all, get renewals to go so that you're constantly compounding, right? So that is a key part of the equation. Uh, so, you know, if you get a child, whether it is a six month journey and they never bought again from you, or they choose you as their companion for multiple it's years. Still maybe it's still it's still focusing on the LTV. LTV increasing, you know, I know with the product DNA and the way you are, you know, I have less doubt on that. My question Good, is... Great. So that's a, yeah. The second thing is, I think referrals, right? Like nail it and get that customer to rave about you. Our customers are, uh, you know, there are two, three things about it, right? Like first principles, is there a reason to expect referrals to happen here? Let me tell you my reasoning from first principles and you can push me back, right? Number one, I am dealing with a category where our users with a certain problem are surrounded by users with the same problem, tight net communities, right? So it's not like I have this problem and even if the product is good, I don't know who to tell this to, right? Everybody around you has that problem. For everybody, it's a burning headache problem for their child. That is number one, right? Number two, in this industry, the pr primary way in which people make buying decisions is where is your child going to tuition? Where is that kid going to tuition? Which book did you buy for your child? Where is your child going to school? That's how they make decisions. So by definition, it's a word of mouth uh, kind of industry offline, right? So because of that, if you can nail the product, that's the risk that you're taking to such a great extent. And we can, right? We are like halfway there. One bet that I would say is let's nail the product so hard and incentivize this customer that why will they not talk about it to someone else? Maybe give two months of free education for this child and two months for that child. You know, you can figure out some incentives, right? But basically nail the product, get word of mouth going. It's not at all a bad shot. It's a very first principle good shot. If that happens for you, then you're talking about virality. If referral coefficient goes above one, then you're sorted, right? Your customer is doing the job for you. So that'll be one major big bet. Uh, you know, so the see, of thinking. there's one part yeah. of it which is a better product will have better word of mouth and this category kind of somewhere is supportive of that. Yeah. There is another, and this, this, this is great. You know, I'm not questioning this, but there is another approach wherein you're creating hooks in the product. Yeah, like the Google's example that you know a kid is playing, they want to play with someone else, and that pulls in yeah. another. Thing, yeah, exactly. That's the third thing good. that I'm gonna come to, right? Which is basically, uh, so if you see, there is a gas. Do you know uh, this person and uh, who sold Nikita, Nikita who, beer? Yes, Nikita beer. Two times he made something go viral within school network. Same product he sold to Facebook twice, right? Yeah. And uh, see, there is a Facebook, once to Facebook and then to this one Discord. Second time to this. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, two times he sells the same product once to Facebook, once to Discord. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So uh, now, fundamentally, first principles we believe you can engineer virality in any category, low cost distribution in any category. This is something like someone like David Sachs will tell you. David Sachs, CEO of PayPal. Yeah. If you yeah. follow that guy, for example, yeah. there is a, there is a talk in which someone asks him, you know, what was in the water at PayPal? Because all of you guys went on to create some insane companies like YouTube, LinkedIn. This class basic. So, what really Yammer, what really makes this uh, group of people successful? And one thing that we said is we are the first to understand that you need to innovate on distribution and you can. And PayPal is one of the first viral products uh, of the world. So, in PayPal, we got this understanding and the skill set that any category you can go into and create these hooks with which you can engineer virality. And the moment you understand that, these guys go into new categories and they can make products spread to billions. So, you know, that belief, that understanding. And, you know, our, we are so far with product, we've been experimentative with Treto, that's how we got here. So we will, that's the first principle with which we are approaching this. We'll get a kid to invite another kid. So we'll keep experimenting to see what makes this go viral. And that's one of the things that is a primary focus area for us in the coming days. So because of that, I think viral distribution, engineering it is going, innovating on distribution is going to be a major thing. If we succeed, we are looking at that whole pot. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll have to succeed, right? So, so there's just uh, one more question I have broadly. Uh, and we're almost, uh, we're almost there, so time wise. Yeah. Um, so somewhere, uh, kind of, you folks started with maths, then moved to English, and there is still talk around maths. So one is, you know, can you take me through that journey? You know, why you started with maths, why you moved to English, and why do you think you will again have maths uh, as as an offering? Okay, sure, I can. Yeah. So we did not start with math. Okay. Okay. It's a long journey, actually. This was way before funding, right? Uh, I've been teaching various sorts of things. You know, even product analytics to people, uh, data analytics to people, just product management to people, starting from that, doing those kind of professional courses to simply teaching kids uh, math, English on my side, helping kids with IIT and so on. So I've been teaching for quite a while. So when we came in, I told you that uh, 
hey, like I came in with this whole thing of education system sucks, I have to redefine it. But now I've changed my thoughts to, no, it is not great for some things, but it's doing some things phenomenally well and educating a large part of the population. So that learning, where did that come from? And I came in, actually, we started with problem solving via games, teaching kids, kids problem solving skills via games. There's a startup in the US called Synthesis. Um, yeah. Long story short, Synthesis is start by, started by, uh, yeah. you know, Elon Musk said, all schools suck. I'm going to create a school for my kids inside SpaceX. He had a school. The guy who ran that school came out and started a startup which did something damn stupid in some sense that no nobody even traditional education will do it. He said, kids will play games and learn problem solving. We looked at that. It made a lot of sense for a variety of reasons, which I don't want to uh, divulge into. We said there's first principle value here. Obviously, kids have to learn things like problem solving. Let's sell that. Let's not sell this usual stuff, right? So that's how we came into the market. We were crazy enough to build these games, figure out what this new pedagogy is like, get customers, get revenue, everything, right? But then we started realizing very soon, it can be a nice business, which is small, but most people, you will spend a lot of time just educating them on what the hell is problem solving skills. Where is tangibility? How is this going to help my child? And, uh, you know, the parent has rightful reasons. They're like, my child is struggling, struggling for basics. What are you doing? Problem solving. I don't know what it is, right? So then we said, okay, if you want to build a large business, then tangibility is important. And our user seems to have much, big, you know, much worse problems. The kid does not know basics of math and English. So maybe we should tackle that first. That literacy is important. You can't ignore it, right? So then slowly we move towards Actually, in between, we went to coding via moving via tangibility. We said something more tangibility, something that's a skill. Coding with games, something like that we made, like a tinker with a class, something like that, right? And we sold that as well. That's when, when I used to talk to the middle Indian customer, they will tell me coding is fine, but can you help me with English and math? Initially, I used to reject that and say, let me find who wants coding. Then one day I said, okay, let me see if I can do something for this English and math movie because this guy is always asking me this. So then we started doing math mm -hmm. and yeah so then we started doing math and that's when i first felt a sense of there is a real problem here like because when you come in here you'll assume that math is solved obviously so many days are there few math is there why choose there what am i doing then you realize no it's not at all solved but that average customer they just don't have any alternative there are so many problems that's how we came to math then we started doing english that's when we started looking at ourselves as a digital home on affordable make it work for people people used to rave about that product because the kid was practicing every day that's when we realized if we can make the kid practice every day that itself is a super value add for the primary grade kid and that parent. Let's just be really good at that. Take it down, teach them skills, measure it, etc. That's when they used to ask us, can you do spoken English? We were like, yes, but I will charge you 30K and that does not make sense for you. So I won't, right? Because I, I don't know any other way to give you a tutor and do that. Then this AI came, yeah. then we said, we know this yeah. is a need. Let's try this and that's over. Super. Very interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Actually, yeah. you know, most of the learnings are, uh, at least in my journey also, I felt, uh, the problem which I ended up going after yeah. was something I assumed is solved. When we were doing uh, shuttle, it was more like uh, within cities solved, all I would have solved it. And we didn't realize that at that price point, at that price point for that user yeah. on a daily basis, that's not a solved yeah. problem. So you go after it. Even yeah. what you're doing now has you know, those kind of uh, things. Yeah, we for didn't sure. it to begin with that this yeah. is a problem worth solving. Yeah. And someone else pointing it, and at one fine day, you are being honest to yourself when you know, those things change. Totally yeah. related. Yeah. A um, couple of other questions. Uh, uh, you know, now that we've talked about English and maths, what do you think will happen first for Supernova? Will you be taking English out of India to, let's say, UAE or Indonesia or Brazil? Or you will be doing maths for Indians? What, you know, kind of, I'm, I'm, this is a little bit into the future, let's say, yeah, yeah. to a certain scale. What will you do next? If New we crack general, virality within India, sorry, sorry, come again. If we, if we crack virality, that's one of the things that I mentioned, right? That we have to crack distribution, we have to innovate and crack that virality and low cost distribution so that it can blow up because there are 200 million kids here, right? So, even if you, I mean, like you, you should be able to take over millions of them with a nice product if you're able to innovate on distribution. If that turns out to be wildly successful, we'll launch math, we will double down on India, and then, you know, we will probably be like, let's strengthen our cushion on India. We are like building hundreds of millions. And uh, that could be what we'll do first. But maybe if we see that we are not getting virality, but we're getting multipliers. So, you know, this market can be uh, huge-ish, but not really like hundreds of millions or billions huge. Then we'll say, let's take English and go to this higher LTV market and then, uh, you know, take over that market because we are aware of players who are doing English learning, doing like 50s millions, hundreds of millions uh, abroad, right? Like be it a Cambly or, you know, Lots of other startups, right? Some of which I have the data, but I can't, uh, uh, you know, share. So um, I... Because of that, that's that's how it could evolve. So it's a very probabilistic. I don't have an answer. If this happens, then that route. Otherwise, this route. That's how we think about it. Fair, fair. That's why you have to kind of. Uh, 
you yeah. can only see that far. Once you get there, you will take your calls. Why cross the bridge before that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, now on the other side, see, you know, while I have tried to kind of push you, but in your mind, let's say a few years down the line, and we we conclude that it has not worked. So, you know, what could be the reasons why supernova has not worked if we are in 2027? Two reasons. One, we failed to innovate on distribution. We were always dependent on this kind of performance marketing inorganic and we never moved past that. That could that could be a potential reason for downfall. Two, see, end of the day, you have to make the product work. Somehow we failed to make the product work and absolutely nail it. Uh, there's still a very bad, broken product. Although with all the tech in the world, still, like you said, the gym problem, there are some things that AI doesn't solve for you. You have to solve it with your product, right? So uh, those things didn't work. The product didn't work. Those are two big reasons I see. Like uh, either of these things, think these things not happening in the next phase could be detrimental to the hundred million, hundreds of millions kind of massive uh, giant. That's becoming that or not, I think depends on these two things quite a bit. Otherwise you could end up being like something smallish in tens of millions of revenue yeah. and that's all yeah. you were, right? So it could be there. And you don't see that, see the technology itself is changing very fast. Now it is, is technology your friend or it could be, you know, that it changes so fast that a lot of things that you have built have already built need not be built and they can be configured. I don't know, you know because like we, we, have, we have been talking about... It's a friend for us. It's a friend for us because we understand what we are building in the sense, see, for example, I see a lot of startups optimizing. Uh, they will be uh, doing something later to optimizing or there'll be people solving math problems right now. So we're very particular that the engineering does not go into something that's going to become redundant in, let's say, two versions from now. We are now already thinking if GPT-4 was such a big step up over GPT-3, assuming it's a similar leap on GPT-5, let's build for GPT-5 and GPT-6. Like, that's how we think. So, but we don't I think... dimensions, it would be a, you know, step up. No, GPT-5. actually, not really. Like, basically, not really. There are a lot of... If you actually go through these papers, by now, people have come up with this, this whole debate of on the research side, right? From an academic standpoint, uh, there is always debates about what do these things understand. So, there are lots of different types of tests for various sort of capabilities within these models uh, for a variety of reasons, right? Somebody is doing it for safety reasons because you don't want these models to become super intelligent and you don't realize it. Somebody is doing it for, I think these models are dumb, let me prove it to you. Somebody is doing it for, what can I really use this for, etc. So, there is a fair amount of literature where you can now say if it's a similar jump, mathematical capabilities will reach something like 99% in one more version. These kind of capabilities are going to be done there is something that you can have a very good sense for an extra plate if you are deep in this, right? And that we know, we have a sense for these are things it's good at. This is where it's going to evolve like this. This one you wait, don't build now. That is something uh, that we're good at. And this rapid pace at which it moves is extremely advantageous for technically very inclined teams where, you know, someone like a CEO like me understands that tech very deeply well. I can cut through it much better than a CEO who's far removed from it and relies on two A engineers to tell them what to do. There's a huge difference between those two teams. So I see it as an advantage for us. I want this to change fast so that we continue to, like we're always three steps ahead. Even if you copy me, tomorrow I am evolving fast with the technology. So you have to constantly play catch up with me, right? So I, I think yeah, I would see it as a strength. Obviously, future has to say, but I think it's a strength. Got it. And are you yeah. LLM agnostic, like they're talking about, uh, like if Claude comes up with a new version, which is significantly yeah. better than, so how much of an effort it is for you to kind of oh, It's like a few days of effort. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Already we are like uh, pointing to a bunch of them and we're switching between them for various reasons. And uh, we keep this in mind. We have a testing framework infrastructure so that if we switch, we know what's really going on well or not. And a bunch of things that uh, we've thought through this and it's not a lot of effort for us. We can just switch in a few days. Got it. Got it. Yep. Yeah. Just uh, one last question, uh, which is more about the round. Uh, this round is being led by an internal investor. Uh, this is, sure. you know, this is a world which operates on signaling, and this is not the best signaling. Why is an internal doing it? Are you not getting interest from outside? What does it mean? You can you help me understand that better? Ha. Huh. Okay, so couple of things, right? Or maybe let me answer that in two to three parts, right? So. Hmm. The number one thing is, see, this is a market where people are not doing pro rata. Okay. Let's be very clear about that. And definitely not in EdTech. So, uh, KE Capital is leading this round. And actually, they put in a small check in the first round. The understanding with which we brought them along on the first round. It's nothing for KE. The first round, they didn't get the percentages, nothing. We gave them a very small percentages so that they can be an observer. 
uh, and if they really like what we're doing our second round is already sorted that's how we thought about it and we brought them in uh, you know if you look at our cap table structures etc it'll become apparent they are not they were not so deep already they were very they had a shallow exposure to us and they it was uh, they had a lot of incentive to say if i really don't believe in it i can easily pull out if i really double, uh, believe in it i can double down so the fact that they actually tripled their stake and put in 2 million dollars after being with us for a year year and a half where they've looked at how we evolved this thing for a year so i i would say if you're really thinking signaling and you're being logical about this i don't think you can get a bigger signal than an internal saying i'm going to triple my stake and i'm going to put 2 million in a market where everybody is saying it take is the stupidest bet that you can take so there is a fear of looking stupid that an investor always there is for more folks that drives investors so beyond that if somebody is saying i know this business and i'm going to put this 2 million when everybody is saying it take sucks that tells you they look at they are looking at something they are close to us and they are seeing something which is very very promising otherwise they don't have to do that so uh, that's the first thing about the signaling now look at it from our standpoint right see i am very first principle when i came into this market people said don't come into this market so i am not coming in this looking at i don't mean to be i don't mean to be rude or i know everything kind of a thing but the genuine truth is i can't make run this business based on what investors think or whether they like what i'm saying what really matters is what my customer thinks and end of the day um, you know beyond signaling all of that it comes down to direct crack these numbers or not that's about it i am not in an early stage where you know somebody will just think maybe this promising and they'll put in money there's numbers that is going to speak for my business if it works out you're putting in money otherwise you're not because the next round is probably something like 10 million 20 million something like that right so i believe i have to make this number work and that's all i am banking on i don't think i would if my numbers are not working it doesn't matter who's on my cap table i wouldn't count on that taking me somewhere so the amount of value that i give for something like how would this look is actually very little call me to first principle that's how our team is right and lastly if i really think about what am i doing my job is to get to pmf and solve all of these unknowns like how do i crack viral distribution etc and i want to remain focused there with my team rather than go out and try to convince some people for 3 4 months what am i doing really when i'm getting the money that i need at valuations that i need and i'm able to focus on my vision and execute and focus on my customer why will i go spend my time with uh, you know a bunch of investors trying to convince them etc i'm just taking the eyes off the ball and that's detrimental for the business at this stage and lastly we had a bunch of term sheets we actually had if you total all the term sheets that we got we probably got 6 7 million worth of term sheets including external investors which we have turned down because we just didn't see with that particular investor we didn't see how much value they were adding so it's not like the market didn't want it there were enough people to take it it's just we were over subscribed we got what we wanted without ever going and talking to a lot of people so we didn't want to waste time we focused on the customer so that's how it is right so that that's what it is being very candid yeah you know totally makes sense uh, the question was also coming from a point of view that this is how the world sees it I, I understand i understand i can optimize for the optics or i can optimize for what i think is really mattering here and i chose to go be first principle and say i'll stick to what i think makes sense and if the optics look bad or whatever i'm not going to optimize it for for it beyond that yeah. got it. so this is super fun um, uh, i really enjoyed the conversation um, thank you uh, a lot of things I, we had not discussed in the past they came out uh, some things were you know kind of uh, i knew them already so but it was on and all really good Really thankful. Uh, thank you for your time. You know, love the conversation. 